You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is Episode 72, covering the week of May 15th through May 19th, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. I'm glad to be here. We're coming to you a day late because I actually took some time off, so... Uh, This podcast is running on a Sunday instead of a Saturday, but uh, we'll be back to our regular schedule next week. Just want to remind everyone before we get started to go out and like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube. Uh, Our Facebook page is, uh, uh, just look for us at Abbeville Institute. Uh, Same thing with Twitter, Abbeville Abbeville Institute, and also our YouTube page, Abbeville Institute. So uh, go on out there and find those things and follow us on social media. Also, if you go to our homepage, uh, www.abbevilleinstitute.org, you will find uh, the ability to give us an email address at the top of the page, and we'll give you a free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. And then you'll get on our email list, which we will send you our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday, and then our weekly email on Sundays. So going out there and do that will let you uh, keep in touch with everything that we're doing. If we have any information going out about conferences or other uh, public uh, events, You'll get information about it that way. We do have our summer school coming up uh, at the in the middle of July. Uh, if you have not registered for that and you want to do so, space is limited. I believe we're almost full, so you might want to contact Dr. Livingston. Uh, that information is available on our website. Uh, in the middle of the page, it says you're invited, and it has information about our summer school. So that should be a very good time. We look forward for, uh, for you to come out to that if you want to. And uh, we should... Uh, Note that our summer schools are not just about education. It's a grand event. There's all kinds of things that go on. In fact, there'll be a tour of Charleston this year, as there is every year. So it's more than just a, a, a stuffy conference where you sit around and listen to lectures. There are other things happening, too. So, uh, And we do have scholarships for students. So, again, all that information is available on the website. Okay, so let's talk about the information that we had for this week. And, of course, this week uh, was an interesting week in terms of news uh, because <clears throat> the final of the Monuments were taken down in New Orleans, uh, and of course the last one coming down was the Robert E. Lee Monument on uh, Friday, I believe, it came down. So uh, a lot of people are upset with this, uh, and rightfully so, Uh, but of course, um, as we've talked about on this podcast, and I wrote about an article last week, uh, this is going to happen. In fact, um, I think that this is just the beginning of other things, uh, but I do believe that eventually the cultural Marxists will overstep their bounds a little bit. I think that they're going to go beyond what Americans will accept. The Confederate statues are the low-hanging fruit, and once they're gone, then, of course, other things are going to be on their crosshairs. And they've openly admitted this, uh, whether it's uh, statues of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, even Joan of Arc in New Orleans, of all things. Uh, But, of course, she represents Western civilization, and that is the real target. It's It's not just Southern statues. It's Western civilization that's under attack. And so our job at the Abbeville Institute, I know a lot of people are very upset about this and they want to do something about it. Our job is to provide the educational background for uh, why we should admire Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis or Western civilization, what the South meant to America. And when I say on this podcast the South is America, this is what I'm talking about. The Southern tradition is the, the American tradition. And as you start tearing down the South, you really tear down America. And if we can start getting that message out more forcefully, I think that'll go a long way to helping people understand what's happening here. It's not just, uh, you know, we're worried about, uh, you know, this the statue of Robert E. Lee coming down. It's, it's an attack on Western civilization. And I think a lot of people in America do realize that. But as you look on social media and other places, it seems that um, – the vast majority of people who like to run their mouth are saying things uh, the opposite. You know, well, these things need to come down because they are a symbol of slavery or they're a symbol of uh, white supremacy or whatever. Take your pick. I mean, of course, I've written, uh, personally written on, on the Abbeville site about, quote-unquote, white supremacy and how this was not a southern ideology, um, that uh, the North was just as much complicit in, quote-unquote, white supremacy as any other people in America. Uh, in fact, white supremacy was an American tradition, uh, not a Southern tradition. And, and um, so I mean, this is something that you know, is often not said. You know, I think that um, 
if we could get to a point where uh, if we're going to tear things down, well, let's start tearing down statues of Elihu Yale or John Witherspoon at Princeton uh, because Witherspoon, of course, sold slaves to help finance Princeton University. Uh, you know, let's tear down the Ponce de Leon statue in, in uh, Florida because, of course, Ponce de Leon was a slaveholder. Uh, but all these things are ignored. Let's put a big stamp, a big warning on Hershey bars uh, because Hershey bars are uh, – the, the coca bean is still harvested with slave labor. So let's put a trigger warning on a Hershey bar. Uh, before you consume this Hershey bar, you should know that slaves are behind making this Hershey bar. Uh, and if we're going to do that, then I guess I mean, we could just – we could say, okay, let's, let's just go for it. But that's not what's going to happen. And so this is why people are pretty upset about Confederate statues, because, again, it's, it's hypocrisy at the highest level. Uh, we're not going to put a stamp on Hershey bars. We're not going to put a symbol on an iPhone that this thing was made with Chinese slave labor. Uh, we're not going to contextualize the Lincoln Memorial by saying, with the quotes of Lincoln, where uh, he said that whites and blacks were not equal. We're not going to do that. Uh, and I think that if at some point Americans will wake up to the problem that's, that they're facing, and that is the eradication of Western civilization. And I, and I do think that the left is going to overplay their hand at some point, but uh, we'll see. So people are very upset, and I think that the pieces that we ran this week fit nicely in with trying to calm, uh, calm the nerves of people and say, you know, it's, we're, it's bad right now. There's no doubt about it. Uh, things are bad, and they're the, the worst they've been since in, in 30 years. Uh, you know, there were attacks on the Confederate flag in the 1980s. There, of course, were attacks on the flag in the 90s. But no one touched monuments. Uh, the flag you know, was a symbol of, of the South, and so we should take that out of the public sphere. But no one was talking about monuments, uh, whether to Lee or Davis or anyone. They were just going to be left there. Uh, but now those things are under attack. The flag has already been eliminated from everywhere on public grounds except for the state of Mississippi. Uh, and so, you know, we're seeing that it's going away. But there is some hope. I mean, I think there is a glimmer of hope. Um, and, you know, the, the proper way to do this, of course, was uh, in, in Alabama where they, they had a piece of legislation passed and signed by the governor which protects all monuments from being removed. It doesn't matter whether it's a Confederate monument or a World War II monument, whatever. They're all protected now from being removed in the state of Alabama. They can't be. Schools can't be renamed. Streets can't be unless there's a commission that decides to do this. And, and that's going to be very hard to do in the state of Alabama. So this is a model for what other states could do. And I know Louisiana is trying to do this. And my hope would be that this legislation in Louisiana gets passed and then the monuments are put back because they were illegally removed. Uh, so, I mean, this, uh, I know that you can't pass ex post facto laws. They're illegal, uh, but perhaps um, you know, something could be done to put the monuments back. We'll see. Uh, it, it's it's um, it is a, a a difficult time for people, and and uh, but we have to to understand that there still is hope. And the first piece for the week is entitled "The South is America's Hope." Uh, it was actually written um, in 1930. It was published in the Confederate Veteran Magazine. And it was written by a man named Count Hermann Kaiserling. And C Count Kaiserling uh, was the, uh, the, married the granddaughter of Otto von Bismarck, who was not a good guy um, in, in many ways. You know, Bismarck was the intellectual force behind the unification of Germany, which caused all kinds of problems later on. But uh, Kaiserling viewed the South as the only real culture in America. And he's writing this in the 1930s, and, and um, he said it's the compliment to the South that there is much for sober thought. There is a strong movement to commercialize the South, to create here the same money-seeking atmosphere, to change your distinctiveness into a likeness of other sections. In fact, to destroy those characteristics upon which our culture depends. Such efforts should be combated, and the South should remain distinctive among the sections. It is that distinction in culture and hope for the future. In that distinction and culture and hope for the futures is what the point was. Uh, and Kaiserling believed in days to come, the northern will be recognized as the poorest, the least superior type. It will mean to America at large what the most narrow type of Prussian means within the German nation. The Middle West will in all likelihood continue to represent America's national foundation. But if a culture develops and the stress is laid on culture, then the hegemony will invariably pass over to the south. There alone 
can there be a question of an enduring culture? And this is something we've talked about in the podcast and on the website over and over again. Even if all these statues are torn down, the Southern tradition, Southern culture remains. Now, um, the barbarians are at the gate. There's no doubt about it. And Southern culture, in some ways, has become a characterization of itself. You know, it's, uh, it, it's not what it used to be. But the foundations are still there. Uh, it's uh, a character of itself, I should say. The, the foundations are still there. The culture is still there. And so those are things that need to be preserved. And the statues, of course, represent parts of that Southern culture. Robert E. Lee being not just a great Southerner, but a great American. Jefferson Davis, the same thing, a great Southerner and a great American. And so when you contextualize these statues or take them down, you're saying these people don't represent what America was. And I think that for most Americans, they looked at Lee as a shining example of what American was. Same thing with Jefferson Davis. The man was a great American before he became president of the Confederate States of America. Uh, one of the most well-respected men in, in Washington, D.C. at the time and in the entire United States. His father-in-law at one point was Zachary Taylor. So I mean, this was a man who was seen across the United States as a great American. But when you take them down and you say this is, you know, Davis is nothing but a slave owner, well, where, where do you stop with that? I mean, do you say that Washington was just that or Jefferson or Madison or Monroe? I mean, where do you contextualize these things and where does it stop? And again, this is why I think the left will eventually overplay their hand. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's going to happen. But for us in the South, what we should be doing is saying, okay, I mean, you take them down, there's another martyr. You've just given us another martyr. Someone else, I mean, when, when the North did this very well, when John Brown was executed, there was a martyr. An example. If we're facing a cultural war, well, here's another martyr in the cultural war. And people need to be made aware of that. And so that will allow us to retrench our culture. And I think this can actually be beneficial as Dr. Livingston has said several times, you know, when the South seceded in 1860 and 61, they had no symbols. Their symbols were American symbols. That's what they had. And they believed themselves to be fighting for the American tradition of self-determination and independence. That was the American tradition. And secession had been openly talked about, North and South, several times in the 80 years that predated the American War, uh, predated the Southern War for Independence, I should say. And uh, the American War for Independence and the Southern War for Independence are the same thing. Or the War for Southern Independence, same thing. So this idea of the South is America's best hope. The South is America's hope still. The Southern tradition still is America's hope. But we have to ensure that that tradition can be recognized. And in that way, we have a piece that we ran on Tuesday entitled, Be Proud, You're a Rebel. Um, and the writer uh, writes under a pseudonym, Dissident Mama, uh, and she lives in Virginia. Uh, but she says, look, again, she points out this is a cultural war. And she attended public schools back in the 70s and 80s in Virginia, where they actually still taught good Southern history. But, of course, those things are now changing. But she, but she understands this is a cultural war for power. And that's the important thing here. And, and uh, in my own podcast, I ran a, 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 an episode a couple of weeks ago entitled Why Slavery? Why is slavery actually important? Well, it's important because it was a symbol of power. As the South uh, could, if, if the South could expand slavery, they expanded their political power. And the North knew this, which is why they attacked it. They didn't attack it for moral reasons. Most Northerners weren't concerned about the plight of slaves. They were concerned about their own political power. And this is the exact same thing today. This is about political power. You demonize one side. You make them out to be subhuman, which is what the intent is. And then you ridicule them to a point where no one will pay attention to them. And then you gain political power. You gain power off of their destruction. Look at us. We're going out there and doing these things. So vote for me so I can do more of them. This is exactly what's happening with these symbols. So what she is saying, this is a con job. 
And it's time to start standing up for uh, your heritage, as she says, your heritage of stubbornness, anti-authoritarianism, hard work and grit, and self-determination. She says it's in your blood, and it is in the South. And so I think that's where we need to understand that there is going to be losses. That, that's inevitable now. There will be losses. But these losses can serve a benefit because it's revitalizing people who are finally understanding, oh my gosh, it's not just a flag. Okay, well, I mean, you know, maybe the flag shouldn't be flying here. I mean, people would think this. We shouldn't fly the flag here. But now you're taking down statues, monuments. And where is that going to end? Because as the leader of the Take Them Down New Orleans has said, we want, we're going after George Washington. We're going after these other people. That It's not just Robert E. Lee. It's the entire structure of Western civilization. So maybe at that point, people will, re will realize this and they'll push back. But that's what it's going to take. And of course, as she says, the Southern tradition is the voice of reason here. And so the Southern tradition was just extending out what was the American tradition for 80 years. Kaiserling said the South is America's hope. We're still saying that today. The South still is America's hope. The Southern tradition and what it means still is America's hope. On Wednesday, we ran a book review written by Clyde Wilson, uh, actually published around 1980. Uh, and it was a review of Mel Bradford's A Better Guide Than Reason. Now, this is a wonderful book, and it, we're kind of changing gears here a little bit, a little bit, but not much, uh, because this particular book is a discussion of the founding period. And it's a different way of looking at the founding period. Um, and I think that's the, that's the important part of this particular uh, tome, because in so many ways, this particular book set the stage for a conservative understanding of the American War for Independence. And that's what Bradford did so well. Because to many people, they looked at the many historians and academics and the public at large, they viewed the American patriots of 1776 as simply precursors to the communists of the French Revolution and later other revolutions around the world, whether it was in Vietnam or China or, I mean, take your pick. Uh, this was, or, or even the Leninists there in, in, in the Soviet Union, the American War for Independence was the same. And, of course, it wasn't. And Bradford does such a good job of explaining that. And you tie the two together, the Southern uh, Crusade or, you know, for Independence in 1861 compared to the American Crusade for Independence in 1776. The Southern cause for independence was the same. And he does such a good job of explaining that through the eyes of people like John Dickinson uh, and, and others, you know, Patrick Henry, uh, and how Lincoln distorted what the Declaration meant through his Gettysburg Address. He does a wonderful job with that in this particular tome. And so if you've never read A Better Guide Than Reason, you should, you should go out and do it. Um, and it's a three-part book, and of course, uh, Dr. Wilson does a tremendous job in explaining all three parts. Um, and so he talks about you know this first um, this first part um, is a discussion of these great Americans and who they were through the lens of maybe forgotten founders, people like Patrick Henry and John Dickinson and William Henry Drayton of South Carolina. And he he uh, he places them with the context of Republican Rome. These were these were real Republicans. In the second part, he focuses on Lincoln's distortion of, of uh, the Declaration. And he compares and contrasts uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, Benjamin Franklin, how there were different types of liberals in the 18th century. And as we've talked about in this podcast over and over again, Jefferson's eyes stopped at his mountains, whereas Franklin was a cosmopolitan man of the world. And I think that's something that people don't often understand. Uh, and he saw the American War for Independence um, 
and the populist tradition. Not as a populist, uh, when we think about you know the the uh, more collectivist portion of populism, but as the extension of people like John Taylor of Caroline and John Randolph, the Southern tradition, the Southern political tradition. And as Clyde concludes, you know, this book is very much a continuation of that tradition. So it should be read and digested and understood. And Bradford is a wonderful writer. Sometimes he could be uh, verbose, but um, I think that if you can get through his, his work, uh, in fact, it was rumored that he used to take you know, an hour to write one paragraph. But if you can get through it, uh, you, you're, there's so much meat to chew on in his books that uh, they're, they're well worth your time. If you've never read them before, they're well worth your time. And that said, you know, these virtuous men, these old Republican men, what it meant to be a Republican with a lowercase r, not with a capital R, not the Republican Party, but the Republican with a lowercase r, what it meant to be that man. If you look at the history of Rome, you'll find that the early history of Rome, uh, you had these virtuous men who, who believed in tradition and honor and custom and the rule of law. The men who were agrarians by nature and only soldiers when called to do so. And that's the men that made up the founding generation. That's the type of man. There was a different kind of republicanism in New England, but there was definitely this strand of, strain of republicanism that came from old republican Rome. You know, Washington, uh, his favorite play was Cato, for example. Addison's Cato. And so we look at these uh, as these men... You know, in, in a toga, for example, and, and uh, you know, this, this type of extension of Republican Rome. But what did that mean? Well, it meant you had to be virtuous. It meant you had to have ethics and honor. It meant you were citizen soldiers, statesmen rather than politicians. And at one time, these type of men were not rare. And the piece we ran on uh, Thursday, A Virtuous Man by Franklin Debreau, um, who is a philosopher at James Madison University, he talks about this man from the Shenandoah Valley, this man that has now disappeared, this virtuous man. Uh, this farmer that worked in the Shenandoah Valley. And the things that made him great. It's as if you're reading something from Livy or Tacitus. Because that's what we had in America. And he brings up a nice point. <laughs> uh, he says that uh, this man was more a philosopher than he knew, than, than, than he knew himself. He quotes, uh, this is a quote, or sometimes he talks philosophically, not just about the old times, but times in general. Quote, when something goes wrong, some folks think it's people, but there are a lot of things people don't do that you can't help no ways. Or then again, eyeing a television or aerial atop a neighbor's house. Quote, had a television here once, but all you had was the same foolishness all the time. Radio's better because at least you can't see it. And when someone suggested he put a, a, a radio on his tractor, he said, no, you can hear music in the air if you want to. You don't need one. And his real quarrel was with daylight savings time. He said, quote, back during the World War, they started this daylight savings. Maybe that's all right for city folks, but for a farmer, it ain't no good. So he ignored it. He kept time by the seasons, by the sun. He didn't, wasn't mastered by the clock. He was a different type of virtuous man. He said, quote, I believe in what the good book says, in treating folks fair, the way you want to be treated. I like to grow plenty and give them away to folks whether it's squash, corn, beets, onions, whatever.
So you have these people at one time, this was published back in the 80s, who were still hanging on to this old tradition. And for a time, I think it, it was disappearing. But there are people now who are trying to go back to this, who are trying to rekindle this spirit. And this is the Southern tradition. This is the Southern Republican tradition. You can tear down the statues. You can furl the flags. But you can't take away the tradition as long as people hang on to it. Take it all down. Just keep singing the songs. In some ways, these statues and these flags are meaningless. They represent something that's tangible that can't be taken away. And that is the tradition itself. So long as we continue to practice it in our homes and among our own people. And for that, I do have hope because I think more and more people are doing this now than they ever have before. The last piece was written by Holmes Alexander, Virginia's Lost Counties, and it's a wonderful view of what was lost when West Virginia became West Virginia, that that one time was Virginia. This is where people like Jefferson and Washington and Madison and Lee, they consider this part of Virginia. But now it's West Virginia, and of course West Virginia is an illegal state. People often say, well, you know, Lincoln supported secession because he supported West Virginia. Well, in order for a state to be carved out of another state, as per the Constitution, it had to have the permission of the state it was being carved from. And, of course, uh, they, the government of West Virginia did not have that permission because the state of Virginia did not give them that permission. So West Virginia is an illegal state. But he talks about the beauty of West Virginia and how it was – really the heart of Virginia in so many ways, and still is. It still was such a part of Virginia. But of course, it's all changed now. It's not like it used to be. West Virginia was a sign of the bigger problem in America. Just do things illegally and say it works and then lie about it to gain the advantage. And that's, of course, the situation with West Virginia and Virginia. As Holmes says, you know, there's these counties and what's gone was the real traditional America. And I think that's why people are very upset, because they see the real traditional America lo losing. And it's not really losing. These are skirmishes, taking a statue down. You're not losing anything. You're losing a symbol. But the tradition still survives. And so, of course, you know, when you can have victories like we had in Alabama with this legislation... You put that against a loss in, in New Orleans. But I think over, overall, and, and what I've seen, it's much more positive than you can get very upset very quickly by looking at the negative. But there's a lot, actually a lot of positive. People are waking up to this. They're seeing things. They're seeing that we need to start listening to the Southern tradition. And again, as I wrote a couple of weeks ago, there are several positives to take out of what's happening. This whole idea of federalism, of independence, secession, nullification, all these things, they would not have been discussed 20 years ago, but they're discussed now. People starting to break away from the state to realize everything is corrupt, to realize the political class is corrupt. Those are positive developments, and they would not have been possible 20 years ago. So don't lose hope. Don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Symbols can come down, but the symbols just represented something that was much more tangible and real, and that is the Southern tradition. And that doesn't go away just because the symbol's taken down. And I often 
point to Ireland. You know, the green flag in Ireland was illegal. It was illegal for years, decades. It was illegal. No longer is it illegal. Because they kept singing the songs. And they kept the tradition alive in their own homes. And eventually, I think the tide will turn. And these things that are now under so much scorn and vitriol and under attack, they will come back if we keep the tradition alive. Until next time, good day. Good day.